I did it. I actually remember. <laughs> okay, I'm going to mute and turn the floor over to Zolt. Zolt, you have it. Okay. Thanks, Jack. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about eclipse photography. Um, I'm going to start out with a brief overview of eclipses just to get everybody on the same page. I think most of you know a little bit about eclipses. Some of you may know a lot about eclipses. Um, and then we'll get more into photography. I'm going to ask, I've asked Rick to talk about sort of more generic photography and a little bit about using cell phones. Uh, you might be surprised that you can use a cell phone for this kind of stuff, um, but there are some applications. And then I'm gonna uh, get more into the more um, technical part on close-ups, uh, close-up photography of, of, the, of the eclipse. So uh, let me get started. I'll share, do the share business here. Um, okay. So here we go. Um, so first of all, what is an eclipse? Well, an eclipse is a time when <clears throat> it, a solar eclipse is when the moon comes between the sun and the earth, directly between the sun and the earth. And the shadow of the moon is cast on the earth. So if we're in that shadow, the moon blocks out the sun. Now there's a quirk of uh, solar system geometry that the sun and the moon are almost exactly the same apparent size in the sky. So um, that's really fortuitous because when the moon totally when the moon comes between the sun and us, it blocks out the bright part of the sun. And there's actually a lot of the sun that is, is faint and you can't see it unless the uh, sun is in eclipse and that's the corona of the, and we'll see lots of pictures about that. Now, now the one other quirk is that the moon, so this is the geometry, here's the moon blocking out the sun's light. And in a very small region of the Earth at any given time is within that shadow. So only where that shadow is it, will people be able to see a total eclipse. Outside of that area, you see the sun, the sun partially covered by the moon. And that's called a partial eclipse. Now, the moon doesn't, uh, the moon the moon's orbit is not a perfect circle, so its distance from the Earth varies throughout different or or orbits throughout uh, the year. Um, sometimes it's farther away. Now, when it's farther away, it does not fully cover the sun. And then you get what's called an annular eclipse. Annular just means ring-like. So at the maximum of the eclipse, there's still a ring of sunlight coming around the the, uh, the moon. Uh, so you will not see the corona, the, the very faint parts that you see during a so total eclipse. Um, now this is significant because there's actually two eclipses coming up. Uh, oh, this and this is what they look like. So during partial phases of a total or an annular eclipse, you see the moon uh, biting into the sun. And then during an annular eclipse, you see that it's not entirely covered. You still see the bright part of the sun during a total eclipse. Then you see um, the sun's corona and some other features that I'll talk about later. So this is all significant because there's two solar eclipses coming up. This year on October 14th, there will be an annular eclipse. That's one of those ones where the moon's too far away and you still see part of the sun shining through. Now that, the, the path of that the maximum of that is still a fairly narrow uh, path. And this is where that path is on a map of the United States. So you can see that it's in the Western part of the country. If you travel out there along this path, you'll see the maximum extent of that part of that annular eclipse. The much more exciting one is next year, April 8th, uh, which is a, is a total eclipse. And here in Indiana, you can see that it crosses the, almost the entire country. So from Texas all the way to Maine um, and in Mexico too. Now they, they say that the 
Now, the, the problem, of course, is April weather is not the best, usually, especially here in the Midwest. Um, Texas may be a little bit better. Uh, Mexico actually has the best prospects for weather, but uh, um, but the, the, the kind of downside of traveling is that uh, if you haven't made reservations already for lodging along this path, you're probably out of luck because everybody and their brother <laughs> wants to be in this narrow path uh, during totality. So it's very difficult to get lodging. Um, but we're fortunate here in Indiana because the path of totality covers a large fraction of the state. Now, um, the time, the duration of the maximum of the eclipse uh, uh, at this in this eclipse here is about four minutes along the center of the path. As you go off the path towards the edge, the duration gets shorter and shorter. And of course, once you're outside of it, you don't see totality outside of this line. But we're especially fortunate here in Bloomington, we're almost right on the center of the path. So we'll get the maximum effect even without traveling. Uh, the unfortunate thing, of course, again, the weather is, is uh, unpredictable at best and iffy at worst. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, here are the times. So uh, the partial, when the moon first starts biting into the sun, happens at 1.49 in the afternoon. Uh, you may see the see these words, first contact, second contact, and so forth. That, those are the technical terms for these events during the eclipse. Then, then totality, when the moon fully covers the sun, begins at 3.05, roughly, just a little bit before 3.05, and lasts for about four minutes. And then another partial phase until 4.22 in the afternoon. Um, I'll make these slides available so you know you don't have to remember all these numbers or write them down. Um, so as far as photography, um, uh, I will uh, maybe I'll actually pass over to you, Rick, and and you can do your segment because I think you're covering a little bit of this kind of general aspect of mm -hmm. uh, photographing the eclipse, and then. Uh, uh, when you're done, I'll, I'll finish up with some more uh, kind of more technical stuff. All righty. Um, I'm sharing. Okay. Let me uh, see here. Um, I'm going to try to share. Let's see. While Rick's trying to do that, I have a question. <laughs> um, how well, I did? I got lucky. It was in the right place at the right time last time. I spent too much time trying to take pictures. <laughs> how would you describe that weird light during total? How, how would you? I don't even have people ask me what it's like. I said I don't even have words for it. It's just you know when it's when it's told you can mm. even see stars in the sky. It's really weird. Yeah, it's it's hard to describe. People have described it as kind of pearly, pearly. light, um, yeah. and and it's all it's kind of like uh, dusk, uh, you know, around sunset and sunrise, uh -huh. because that's what you have. You basically have a, a post sunset situation, but the sunset is all around you. It's not just in the west. Mm -hmm. Do so, the shadows do, do the shadows get weird? The shadows, yeah, during the partial phases, the shadows get kind of dilute. Um, yeah, okay. I would describe it that way. Actually, what I was going to say in the beginning, one of the things I wanted to say in the beginning was a lot of people recommend that if it's the first time you've seen a total solar eclipse, don't try to photograph it. <laughs> because you'll be spending so much time fiddling with your equipment that you'll miss the neat parts of the, the neat kind of experience of the eclipse. Now, if you've practiced and you've got everything down and you know what you want to do, 
then yeah, you know, sure. But you obviously anyone can you know you can photograph it if you want. But that's one of the recommendations that to try not to at least try not to be so focused on your your equipment that you're going to miss the experience because it is kind of a unique experience. Well, I can testify that's true. Yeah, yeah, I can as well. Um, can everybody see this my screen? Yes, very clearly, nice, loud and clear. Okay, great. So yeah, I just I would echo Zolt's comments. Um, you know, if it's your very first eclipse, uh, you know, double think about if you want to try to photograph it. But if you still want to photograph it, practice, practice, practice until you're sick of it, and then practice some more. <laughs> Uh, in 2017, I drove my wife crazy because we'd sit out on our back porch and I went through the entire sequence. Um, I was using utilizing software and all that. And I made her practice taking filters off and timing and all that. But but anyway, um, just to go through uh, a, a few sort of general kinds of concepts and, and things. And some of uh, Zolta and I both have have done some presentations at uh, down there at IU. Uh, in the astronomy group uh, for some of their train the trainers uh, workshops on the eclipse. So a couple of these slides may look uh, pretty pretty familiar, but uh, generally speaking, you, you sort of have a choice between trying to do wide angle uh, types of pictures of the eclipse or zoomed in or, or, or close up types of things. And there's, you know, pluses and minuses uh, to both, but uh, you know, the wide angle, not only can you see the eclipse, but you can you know see the surroundings, the sky, the people, and kind of the unique way that the sky gets darker and the surroundings gets darker. But out there on the horizon is still a little bit lighter as well. So it gives you a lot of opportunities to do a you know variety of, of different types of, of photography. And um, you know also um, if you you know set these things up and are familiar with stacking and and things in Photoshop, you can set up and do some really nice composites showing all the phases uh, of the uh, the eclipse process. And that's that's a lot of fun uh, to try to do. But the, the the wide angle kinds of things are really very unique. The only drawback is the you can see in this slide, this the eclipsed sun, fully eclipsed here, is really tiny. Um, and I think Zolt's going to get into a lot more of, you know, how do you get in up and closer and all that. But the, the, the fundamental thing, and you've all heard this a hundred times, it's so important is you, you've got to use solar filters and these go on the front of your lens, uh, front of your spotting telescope, your telescope, binoculars, whatever it is you're using, these solar filters are on the front of that. And, uh, and then when you get to deciding what focal length, that's gonna greatly determine what the image size is gonna be in your uh, film. If you, you know, people still do 35 millimeter film or sensor or, or whatever. Um, but as, as Zolt, you know, mentioned a little bit earlier, if you can, you know, really zoom in and get, uh, you know, totality, this is the corona that you see around the sun. And it is really breathtaking. and you do end up doing a little bit of Photoshop uh, work afterwards to sort of bring out some of the uh, uh, texture and, and structure of this, but a lot of scientific research cannot be done unless there is a total eclipse. And, and I'm very fortunate to once again, be part of the um, Astronomical Society of the Pacific and Google have teamed up to do what's called the mega movie and they're signing up uh, a number of photographers across the country to photograph the entire total eclipse and then submit uh, all these pictures and they put together a time-lapse video and do a lot of research and all that. So it's, it's gonna be a lot of fun to, uh, to do that again. So um, photographing. Uh, you know, many of you may have, you know, DSLR cameras, uh, mirrorless cameras or, you know, telescopes, whatever. Uh, but an awful lot of people are going to come out and say, well, gee, I, I just I want to snap a couple pictures. All I've got is a cell phone. What do I need? What what do I do? Where do I start? What's what's possible? And and surprisingly, you can do uh, a fair amount. But 
one thing I I highly recommend <clears throat> recommend using is a tripod. And you know, here on the left, you can go to Walmart and spend seven or eight dollars and get you know some <laughs> little bitty thing. And even flimsy little things like that are better than than nothing. Um, but I, you know, again, I suggest you get something a little bit sturdier, a little bit more rugged. Um, and then what you can do, uh, Amazon or wherever, you can get a uh, cell phone holder. Uh, again, very, very simple device, of, you know, maybe $5, you know, maybe a little bit more. Um, and just, you can see, you can just simply clamp your, your phone in there and that's going to help you a lot in aiming and keeping your phone still for a lot of these exposures, uh, which will help the sharpness and, and, and detail of, of what you do. Uh, and, and then if you want to get more exotic, uh, you can go online. Uh, again, I looked up a couple of these things on Amazon and uh, you can get these clip-on telephoto lens attachments um, or you can buy these kits that have a, a little tripod and the attachment holder for your cell phone. Uh, and you can even get even more exotic and, and get some more of these more sophisticated clamp on uh, types of things. And, and, and this is an example of a spotting uh, telescope. Uh, but, but essentially what they do is, is just give you the opportunity to hook your cell phone up to uh, a more magnified viewing uh, type, type of setup. But, uh, it, it all comes back to, do I need a solar filter with my cell phone? Uh, you, you certainly do with a telescope, with your camera, you know, a zoom lens or, you know, a, a prime lens of any length. But, you know, a lot of the questions were about, what about a cell phone? So I, I've heard conflicting things. And so I called uh, Apple tech support. And, and interestingly, they have no official recommendations one way or the other about the eclipse and, and using solar filters. And so I, I, I was fortunate enough to get one of their senior technicians uh, on, the, on the support line. And, and he said, you know, we've all probably have seen beautiful sunsets and we whip out our cell phone and take a quick picture. And it doesn't seem to, you know, hurt your phone or, or anything like that. But, you know, these, these phones do have optical and digital zoom magnification. And he said, that's when you should be using a solar filter. And uh, especially if you're using any type of those, uh, you know, at attached kinds of, of uh, telephoto lens attachments, you'll want to use a, a solar filter along with that. And if you're doing long exposures as well. Um, but the one thing, and I'm sure Zolt will, will touch on this, is during totality, you want to take your filters off. Not before or after, but during totality, you got to take those solar filters off. And if you forget, all you're going to see is blank or black pictures because nothing will record. So uh, I decided to do some just very, very, very simple experimentation went outside my backyard and nice sunny day. And, and so here on the left, um, I was just using my old iPhone six, so I didn't care if it got messed up or not, but thought I'd try some experiments. And so this is, you know, zoomed out all the way. This is about the typical focal length of, you know, your, your typical cell phone and, and without a filter there on the left. And then I took a solar uh, eyeglass, uh, filter and just held it over my cell phone camera and you can see what it looks like when it is filtered so the th the main difference is on the right yes it is filtered but you see nothing else you, you see this bright white dot and a little bit of brownish around it but you don't see uh, the club you know, meeting on how to take pictures on this solar eclipse um, or oh, oh, today's class, today's Thursday. Well, it's a special meeting. Oh, okay. And whenever you're ready for the birthday card, just so you oh, know, okay. well, I don't want to say it again. You don't have an apology. Okay. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, you know, zoomed out. Um, but then 
um, zoomed in, uh, again, here on the left uh, with a cell phone, there's no filter and, and, and sorry, that should say zoomed in, not zoomed out, I apologize. But cell phones cannot handle the brightness, the, intens the intensity and, and everything of a, of a big bright sun like this. Uh, on on the right hand side again zoomed in filtered and you uh, you know you can get a pretty good shot of the sun now I was hand holding this I didn't use a tripod so it's a little little blurry I didn't try to focus carefully but you can get an idea of zoomed out zoomed in and, and what you can accomplish with uh, with a cell phone and so um, you know most people appreciate that during an eclipse. You know, there's partial phases and the sun gradually gets from very, very bright to darker to darker to darker and then totality and then, you know, the reverse happens. So the question often asked is, well, is there a cell phone app or something that can help me do just simple eclipse photography? And and, and yes, there is one. Um, and and I, 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 I like this one. Uh, it, it's very, very simple. It's, it's called Solar Snap. Is, is the name of it. Um, it comes in a kit and, and inside that kit, it has a couple of uh, solar eyeglasses. It also has a couple of eclipse filters for your cell phone that just utilize Velcro and you just stick it on the back of your phone and it will cover up your uh, cell phone camera. But it, um, it, it has uh, it sliders on it to adjust exposures and things for, you know, full sunlight, partial annular that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And, and of course the total eclipse. And, um, you know, the thing that's again, very, very special is this, this, the whole eclipse sequence lasts about two and a half hours. But what most people certainly focus on is, is totality itself. And that, uh, as, as Zolt mentioned, is only going to be, you know, right about four minutes long or so. Um, so the, the, the nice thing about this uh, solar eclipse thing, this is, this is the kit. Uh, again, that um, shows you a couple of those small um, solar filters that you uh, utilize Velcro and they snap over your, your uh, cell phone camera uh, lens. And, and again, it's, it's put them on, shoot, and, <laughs> and you just share it with your friends and, and whomever, but th uh, this is the screen. This is what the app looks like on your phone. And up there at the top, you can see there's a couple of buttons here where you can select uh, just regular photos or you know partial phases or the total phase. And, and again, I just went outside, aimed it at the sun, was not using a, a tripod or anything. So you can see it's a little blurry and all that, but You've got three sliders here to, to zoom in, adjust the exposure and uh, adjust the focus. And, and this little button over here, this is this lock thing. So once you get focused on the sun, you can press this lock button here to you know, keep your focus uh, solid and, and straightforward. And the other thing I like is this other little thing down here where it says number one, if you you know press this button, you'll take a single exposure. But if you press this, it'll show a number three. And what it does is it'll do a bracket. So one at the assumed correct exposure, one above and one below. So it's a nice little functioning thing. Uh, it's very simple. You do not have to buy the kit to get this software. You can just uh, Google Solar Snap. You can download it and you can be using it, you know, within two or three minutes. Uh, the kit is just kind of nice because it comes with those filters and, you know, Velcro and a couple of the Eclipse uh, glasses. Um, but the thing I like about it, it's very easy. It's very simple. It's step by step. Uh, people do not have to know a lot of detailed Eclipse information or knowledge. Um, there's just three sliders and you just take it and go for it. Um, there is a, a YouTube video. Uh, again, I, I can certainly share these slides and I, I won't play this here. This is a little three minute video by the guy who 
uh, developed this solar snap kit, but it, it shows just how incredibly simple this is to use for the uh, total, total eclipse. Uh, one other uh, uh, app, uh, piece of software that I very much recommend, and it's very, very popular, uh, it's called Solar Eclipse Timer. And, and that is, this is not something that you use to take pictures. This is a talking, if you will, uh, app on your phone. And, and in essence, what it is, or what people do, is they'll have this app running on their phone or their laptop or their iPad or something, sitting right next to their telescope or their DSLR or whatever you know photographic equipment that they have. And this thing talks to you. It's, you're gonna plug in uh, GPS coordinates, uh, date, time, location, that type of thing. And then it's going to know the local circumstances for uh, you know, C1, C2, C3, C4, all the way through in totality. It will talk to you about, uh, you know, two minutes to go, one minute to go, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, take your filters off, you know, maximum totality. And, you know, it just walks you through. It's talking to you while you might be just watching it or, you know, making adjustments with your camera uh, setup. Uh, again, it's very detailed, uh, much more so than uh, much more so than the Solar Snap uh, kit. And the other thing with this, it's an ebook uh, about getting ready for the eclipse, and this is a phenomenally detailed about any and every aspect you can think of associated with uh, with the eclipse. It's uh, I think it's about. 470 pages long, <laughs> but it's very good. It, it, it's really, really, very, very, very good. Um, so just kind of in summary, you know, for any kind of cell phone based photography, um, I think you might get better as results if you use an attached zoom lens. You certainly don't have to, but it's something to consider doing it. Uh, and then, you know, the best recommendations I have is if you're going to be zooming in or using a, a zoom attachment or telephoto lens attachment, use a solar filter, definitely try to use a tripod. It will make your life so much simpler and easier. And if there is, uh, with the you know, most cell phones, there's auto flash and autofocus. You want to turn all of those things off and utilize the manual uh, adjustment capabilities of your phone or the manual uh, capabilities of that solar snap. Okay, so that's it. Thanks, Rick. Um, okay, so I will resume. Um, share my screen again. And I'll kind of start from this point. And uh, yeah, I think. A lot of what Rick talked about applies not just to cell phone photography, but any any photography of the eclipse and the time surrounding the eclipse, whether it's partial phases or whatever. Um, I'm going to get into more of the, if you want to really zoom in and get those detailed pictures of the, of totality with the, with the, um, Corona and all that stuff. You you do. It's more specialized. So, I I wanted to kind of introduce it by talking about the all the consider many of the considerations that go into dealing with an eclipse. So, you know, we've talked about location. Uh, we've talked about weather. Those are obviously very important considerations in just seeing the eclipse at all. Another one is duration, which again, we've touched on. Uh, Rick said, mentioned that the total duration, including the partial phase is about two and a half hours. Duration of totality is only about four minutes. So if you're gonna take pictures during totality, you have to be prepared. Um, you have to have everything set up. So you don't have much, you don't have any time to fool around with equipment, changing lenses and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, angular size, again, Rick, touched on this. I'll, I'll, I'll mention a, a literal rule of thumb is that if you hold your thumb out at arm's length, it subtends 
about two degrees. Uh, for comparison, the sun and the moon subtend a half a degree. That's a quarter of your thumb's width at arm's length. We think of the sun and the moon being fairly large in the sky, especially when they're near the horizon, when we see them against trees and houses and stuff. In fact, they're really small in the sky. So if you want to see any detail on them, you, you need a uh, fair amount of magnification. Um, where is the eclipse in the sky? Where are you going to be pointing? Um, this is where some, uh, some of the software comes in. There's lots of software to uh, kind of like a planetarium show you what the what the sky looks like at any time, any place. And uh, just as you might imagine, since the since the totality is happening around three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun will be fairly high in the sky. Uh, now you may have seen pictures of previous eclipses where you see the sun against uh, 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 landscape features. It'll be a lot harder to do that with the eclipse, this eclipse, because the sun will be fairly high in the sky. So that's another consideration. The big consideration with eclipses is dynamic range. The, the difference in brightness between when the sun is either not covered by the moon at all or in the partial phases and during totality, that difference in brightness is immense. So that's where the filters come in. So to get the brightness of the sun in a reasonable range to photograph it and to look at it, you need a specialized solar filter. And even during totality, the range of brightness in the corona from very near the sun to much farther away is very great. If you want to get that very faint stuff, outer stuff, you need a lot of different exposures. And I, again, I'll, I'll uh, talk about it a little bit more in detail. And also the sun moves through the sky, as we all know. If you're taking a sequence of exposures with a with fairly high magnification so that the sun fills a reasonable part of your frame, uh, the sun's going to move through that frame fairly quickly. In a couple of minutes, it'll be out of your frame. So you need to take that into account. Are you going to have it on a fixed tripod? And if you have your camera on a fixed tripod, you'll have to be re, uh, reorienting your, your camera all the time, which is doable, certainly. Um, there are also devices you can get which will track the sun. So they're fairly simple devices. They're more complex devices that are designed to uh, hold telescopes and take very long exposures of the night sky uh, with very great precision. So, yeah, uh, um, Rick said that when the uh, maximum starts, you should take the solar filter off the yes. cell phone. Do you do the same with the camera? Yes, uh, you don't want the solar filter on there because it's taking away so much light and the corona is so relatively faint that you won't see anything. You won't get anything in your photograph. So yes. And that's what some of these timing apps like Rick was talking about tell you when totality starts, they'll say, take your filters off now, totality is starting, which is a nice little benefit because some it, it's easy to forget, you know, in the in the heat of the moment. It's very easy to forget that you've got this massive filter on your camera that you're not, you're not gonna see anything. Thank you. So let me talk about partial phases a little bit. Again, the solar filter. Huh? Let me talk a little bit about the filters. Um, it's kind of important to get the right filter. There's a lot out there that you can get sort of get in trouble because there's some sort of maybe shady uh, sources that, that don't really have the best uh, material. But um, so I don't know if you can see that this is one example of a, of a good solar filter. And you know, I'm sure you've all seen those glasses. It's the same material, just kind of in a different form factor. This is another one you can get. You just hold it up to your eyes, obviously. And they, they do have these, uh, I don't know, you probably can't see it, but there's some, some uh, sort of labeling on here that indicates that it's kind of official but you can't even really depend on that because obviously those can be, you know, cloned or whatever. But um, I've got a, a a link to a to a page which talks about talks a lot about filters and what's good and what's bad and where you can get 
the good ones. And I will include that with, um, I will make my slides available and include that link in there. And again, for the partial phases, whether you're viewing it with your eyes or through a camera, you need the solar filter. Here's, a, here's another example. This is a material that you can, uh, you can buy filters made uh, in different sizes to fit various lens sizes or telescopes already made. They're solid ones, uh, and this, but this is a flexible material you can buy. It's essentially like a mylar film with the with the solar filter material on it. Is Zolt, are, are you yeah. showing that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing any change when you keep saying here is a example of something. Oh, don't you see that in front of my face? Are oh, we see the slide? I'm, I've got it. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. So let me stop sharing. And okay, now we can see what so you're doing. I, you can see these. Okay, so here's the um, the little solar filter that you can hold it up to your eyes, and here's a one that that I made from that flexible mm -hmm. flexible material that fits on the actually it's from my smaller telescope, but you can make them or buy them in different sizes to fit on different size optics. Um, but I will say that you probably, if you're going to go that route, you probably want to do it as soon as possible because they are very popular. And obviously, they're coming in great demand as we get closer and closer to eclipse time. Yeah, Zola, I was just going to mention real, real quickly, um, I had a newer lens that I bought and I wanted to get a solar filter for it. And it is extremely difficult to find the pre-made ones. Uh, they run anywhere from $80, $90, $100 to $150, depending on the diameter of those, uh, you know, the, the uh, objective uh, on your, on your uh, at, or outer lens. Uh, but you can make them. Those, uh, you, you buy the sheets of film, and what Zolt just showed is, is just like what I made, and you can get those sheets of solar film for, I don't know, $25, $30, and it's a very simple process to make. I have a question. Um, I have uh, a filter from uh, the last eclipse. Do those degrade over time? Should I be concerned about that? I I don't. I had I actually got that question before, and I don't know the answer to that. But one thing you can do is, if you look <laughs> through a solar filter during the day, don't look at the sun. Look at anything else in daylight, and if you can see anything through that filter, don't use it. Okay. You should be you shouldn't be able to see anything through it and also examine it very carefully for holes and scratches if it's got if it's damaged in any way don't use it so those are the guidelines i do not know if that material i don't if it's reflective uh like the ones i was showing i unless they're damaged i don't think they deteriorate last if time they were indicating that they did Okay. I wasn't in totality last time, but I had heard that they were saying if you've got an old one, don't use it. It deteriorates like it's got a, a year expiration date or something. Mm. That's well, my that, way to buy filters. That's probably good advice. Probably good advice. Question. Any thoughts of using two polarizing filters? That, um, I, I was going to mention that um, it's not recommended to use photographic filters either neutral density filters, no matter how dense they are, or polarizing filters um, for several reasons. One of which is that they really aren't dense enough. And two, um, they operate by absorbing light. And when they're absorbing light, they're going to heat up. And there's a, there's a chance that they may break and crack. And then they're going to let the full sunshine through. And that's not good for either your eyes or your camera. So the recommendation is not to use those. Now, people have, uh, in fact, Jack said that he used a uh, very dense neutral density filter with no problems. I personally would not recommend it. That's just, that's what most people say, most experts say. Um, any other questions about filters? <laughs> I realize that's that's probably the prime <laughs> topic that people- uh, Yeah, so, I mean, even filters, from reputative, reputative uh, retailers that 
are, I mean, literally say they are for solar photography. Are you you're saying we shouldn't trust those? No, if it's, if it's okay, for sorry. photographing the sun, then that's okay. Oh, okay. Just gotcha. a standard neutral density filter is not recommended. Oh, okay. And even, Understood. I was just reading the, that link um, about filters, and it said people say you can use like uh, welding, like welding goggles, welding filters. There are certain welding filters that, that are recommended to use, others are not. So you got to even be careful with that. Um, so, anyway, that just, you know, uh, uh, these are the recommendations that, that I've seen. So, um, so anyway, moving along, um, camera, a, a camera for, for partial phases or for uh, environmental type stuff, landscape type stuff, obviously any camera goes. I mean, you can, you know, you, you, whatever camera you have, whether it's a cell phone or a DSLR or a mirrorless or whatever, and whatever lenses, you know, uh, you're going to get pictures of the people around you. And that can be very interesting. You know, it's a dynamic time. Uh, people are excited and all that stuff. And, and the shadows are changing. The light is changing, all that stuff. Um, and one, one, one thing which I, I didn't mention before is um, with the partial phases, an interesting phenomenon that um, if you use a, a pinhole uh, to, and, a, and a, some sort of screen, um, then the, the pinhole will create an image of the sun on the screen. And during the partial phases, you can see that, that crescent phase of the sun. And then this can happen uh, even in nature. So trees, the spaces between the leaves of a tree will act like little pinholes and you'll see shadows on the ground. You'll see the crescents during partial phases of this multitude of little crescents on the ground. You can even use your hands uh, across your hands and make little pinholes with your hands and do the same thing. So there's all, all kinds of fun things like that. That's sort of fun things to do with kids or just for different photography uh, opportunities and things. And, and again, the lens for landscapes and stuff, you can use any lens. For, for close-ups, uh, like if you want to get the corona during totality, you do need long, longer focal length. Is, uh, Rick showed that diagram anywhere from 200 millimeters to say 500 millimeters is probably a good range of focal lengths. You'll get plenty of corona. You'll get a good size for the uh, disc of the sun and the moon in your frame. Um, exposure, uh, again, you know, usual exposure methodology for uh, regular shots to the landscape, whatever. But for the for the details, for the for totality, it's kind of a different world because again, the dynamic range is very high. Uh, you your camera is not going to be able to auto expose. It's not going to be able to auto focus on anything. So you need to be prepared for that. You need to pre focus. Uh, uh, you need to um, set your camera to manual exposure and. At the very least, run through a very long range of exposures. Um, I'll show some examples. And there's a, a link to an exposure calculator uh, mm. if you want to kind of get an idea beforehand of what that range of exposures should be during totality. Uh, during during partial phases, it, it's pretty much one exposure. The, the brightness, the overall brightness of the landscape is going to change because more and more of the sun is getting blocked by the moon. But the brightness of the sun itself will not change. The exposed region of the sun is all the same brightness of the sun's disk. So that's why you need to filter all the way through the partial phases up until totality. And again, support, you know, you want to use a tri good tripod or a tracking mount um to be able to track the motion um, across the sky um, I mean you can use a, a stationary tripod and but you with a longer lens you again you will need to re readjust your position to follow the sun across the sky so I'll reiterate this uh, 
the fields of view. So as you can see with a full frame camera, uh, you know, 500 to 1,000 millimeters is a good uh, range. Um, with a crop sensor, uh, obviously you can use a shorter focal length of 400 millimeters good with a crop sensor to get a reasonable size of the disk of the sun and a full amount of the corona kind of filling your frame. But during totality, again, you can remove, you should remove the filter, otherwise you'll get blank shots um, and bracket the exposures. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large range of brightnesses between the inner part of the corona and the outer part of the corona. Now, when I say automatic camera control, I don't mean auto exposure. I mean, some kind of automation to do those exposure sequences. So if your camera has an inner velometer built in, that allows you to take a sequence of exposures. Um, you can set it up to, to do a bracket sequence. And then you're, you, know, you're in a, you set up your inner velometer to take that number of exposures and it will run through that bracket sequence each time the inner velometer fires. Um, and there is there is external software, and I don't, uh, Rick, you may have a better handle on this. Uh, there's some software that I used, and I know Rick used, to actually control the camera during the eclipse. It was very sophisticated. It knew the timing. You put in uh, your, your location. You could plug in a GPS so it knows your location. The, the timing of the eclipse is uh, critically determined by your location to, to you know, nearest fraction of a second. Um, and this software, if it knows your location, it knows the timing precisely. So you could preset a sequence into the software and it would fire that sequence through your, through your camera during the, the eclipse. So it was completely hands-off, it was really nice. But when I last looked at that software, it's called uh, Solar Eclipse Maestro, at least the Macintosh, there's a Macintosh software that's Solar Eclipse Maestro. There's a PC version, I have it, I have it on another slide. Um, that was not updated recently. So I don't know what the status is of that. Um, Zolta, specifically for Solar Eclipse Maestro, um, it's only on Mac. Uh, the author, uh, Xavier Jubile, uh, is over in France, and he um, has not updated it since, I think, 2019. Uh, I've actually been in contact with him and emailing back and forth, and uh, the, the, the challenge is the, uh, for those of you that use a Mac, um, the only uh, iOS version that still supports this software is Mojave. Anything, yep. anything after Mojave, which is, gosh, four or five different versions, is not supported because the Solar Eclipse Maestro is a 32-bit uh, oh. software, and he told me the complexities of rewriting to make it work on 64-bit would just be way beyond his time frame and capability. So I had to take my Mac and partition a 100 megabyte partition to put Mojave on it. And I can still run the older version of the software, which is great. It still runs. But the challenge I'm having now is I've got newer cameras. I've got a new mirrorless and some other things that are not supported yet. So I've got my fingers crossed <laughs> that he's gonna have support for some of the newer mirrorless versions for Canon and Nikon and, and other ones. Uh, Rick and Zolt, uh, uh, there's a question in the audience that I'd like to ask if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, one of the uh, members, uh, the question uh, shoots in infrared. The filters block white light at 850 nanometers and below. Is there any way to test for safety on, on an infrared image using some of the solar films? Or what are the complications if you want to try to shoot infrared of the eclipse? I, I don't really know the answer to that. <laughs> well, what I, would, I guess what I would recommend is still to use a solar filter. Because if it's the reflective kind, I think that's going to be um not wavelength dependent so i would test it using a solar filter and the infrared filter 
that's my only recommend. I don't otherwise I don't really know. And I don't so, really know what the advantage would be of doing it in the infrared. I don't think it's going to be very different from the visible. Okay. Now, if uh, you had a if you had a, a narrow solar hydrogen filter, that would be a very different view of the sun. So uh, that, I hope Jim that Eck it, has his hand raised. Is that it's Jim? Jim, Jim it's Jim oh. Eck. Jim, you, you Jim asked your question. Okay. Yeah, Jim had that question. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I don't really know the answer to that. Okay. So what I think I heard you say was, try it out on a day when you're not trying to get all the cool stuff captured. Oh yeah, I'll certainly try it. Okay. Out. <laughs> okay. And that, just to be safe, I would use a solar, a regular solar filter. I'd be afraid to you'd still fry your sensor in the infrared with the infrared filter, but I don't really know. And again, it's if it's a regular photographic filter, it's going to be absorbing a lot of that. Wow. Visible light, and I, I would be a little leery of it. But okay, <laughs> Rick, did, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I I don't have any experience with infrared, uh, but but I would I, I would agree with Zolt. It, it's something that uh, you know you have to experiment a little bit. But I, I you know, my gut feel is infrared only filters are going to. Be a little bit dangerous. I, I always would have a solar filter out there in front. Okay, I think that answers the question. Uh, okay, hey, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just make one other uh, point here. Uh, Zolt, you were talking about a tracking mount uh, for yeah. uh, um, being able to keep, uh, if you're using a fairly long zoom, being able to keep uh, tracking mm -hmm. the sun. Most of the tracking mounts, that, j just as a reminder, have to be lined up with the rotation of the earth, which for at least for what I've done, you have to be able to see the North star and then do an alignment yeah. there. You're not going to see the North star during the day. So you've got to set things up beforehand on a clear night. Just, just a reminder. That, that's a very good point. Um, mm. I, I did not do that. The 2017 eclipse. I did have a tracking mount. I set it up roughly to the point to North and with the, uh, Altitude adjustment set roughly to the lat proper latitude, and it worked fine. I had to readjust the positioning over the span of the entire eclipse, not during totality. It's not long enough to change that much. Um, but I did have to reposition it, but it was close enough. So those are your two options. You, you can set it up the night. If you're going to be in the same location the night before, you can polar align it with the, the pole at night and then if you don't move it you're fine the next day or if you don't have that option then you, you'll be close enough if you uh you know if you just roughly pointed it north and that that was my experience um so in terms of exposures th this this gives you an idea of the range that we're looking at so there is um, a, uh, a large range here between the, the longest exposure here, one fifteenth of a second, to get mm. a lot of the corona. And then um, the, these other ones, the, the first and the, the top left and the bot two bottom right are just, just at the beginning of totality and the end of totality, where you see just the very smallest part of the sun showing through, and you still see a little bit of the corona. Um, and you can see the range of exposures here. Um, but the, the top, the top center and top right are both fully during totality, and you can see this. This is a, I believe, a six stops of exposure. Um, so you can see that that huge time. And with the shorter exposures, the nice thing is you get some of these details around the sun. These red patches are called prominences. That's that's gas that's shooting out from the sun um, very high speed. And uh, so sometimes you'll see those prominences uh, and it's shining in the light of hydrogen, hydrogen gas. 
Um, so that's that. As far as equipment, uh, this is the equipment that I use for the 2017 Eclipse. Uh, again, a, a standard uh, DSLR, standard lens. This is a 200 to 500 millimeter zoom lens that I was shooting at 500 for the, for the Eclipse. Here's a solar filter on that. And, and here's the tracking mount. So this, as Don was mentioning, this axis points at the uh, North Pole, of, uh, which is parallel, uh, the pole star, which is parallel to the Earth's axis. And so it only has to rotate around that axis to track objects in the sky. And it has a motor in it to uh, that, that goes at just the right speed to compensate for the Earth's rotation. Um, what else? Well, the tripod, and that's self-explanatory. And then a uh, computer with the uh, solar because Maestro running, but as we discussed, not sure that's an option this time. Is that, gonna... is that Maestro? Is that the software that Rick was referring to? Yes, that's okay. the one that runs on a Mac. There's one that runs on a PC that I don't know the status of that one either. It looked like it wasn't updated either. So I don't know what I'm going to do if that's the one available. Um, and then it's a little bit scary. Um, the, the other yeah. quick piece of software is called S E N T, uh, set N C S E T N C. Um, I think the last update on it was 2020 or something like that with some newer camera models. Uh, it's a windows only. And there's another one called eclipse orchestrator. And oh, I've, yeah. I've only read about it. I've not run it or anything I've run the set NC with my new mirrorless cameras and it seems to work okay, but it was a little glitchy, so I'm not so okay. sure. So those are the three I'm aware of. Yeah, the York, I've, I've run across the orchestrator one, but again, I don't know the status. So then when I was doing this in 2017, I had a second camera set up and just to take a wide view, um, I just did a time-lapse of the entire eclipse um, with, a, with a wide angle lens. And a, an intervalometer just just shooting frames every few seconds. And I will mention this uh, solar blanket uh, on the on the rig because uh, you're in during partial phases you're in in full bright sunlight, and you know the, all that black stuff the lenses and the cameras heat up quite a bit. So this solar blanket helps uh, quite a bit to keep stuff cool. It looks like you were in a popular location that day. <laughs> well, it was a great location. It was the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Uh, the weather was absolutely ideal, perfectly clear. And yeah, there were a number of people there. The lodging was limited around there, so it wasn't super crowded, but uh, there were a number, number of people. And then uh, I'll just, just touch on post-processing. It's not that different from any other post-processing, except you got this high dynamic range business to, to deal with. And uh, this is my Lightroom light table of some of my pictures. And you can see the range of exposures, uh, from very long exposures that actually show detail in the shadowed part of the moon. I'll talk about that in a second. And so, you know, the normal things you do to deal with uh, high brightness range you can deal with in post-processing. So one thing you can do is do an HDR composite and uh, it may not work. The automated ones, they're always getting better, of course. I, uh, I, I did this, I did it in Photoshop with masking, um, but uh, so I was able to take these four or more, I don't remember how many I used, but this is four examples of the difference. And again, you can see that there's actually detail in the shadowed part of the moon, which surprised the heck out of me. I didn't even know that was possible to get, uh, but with a very long exposure, you do get that detail. And that, and there's no sunlight, no direct sunlight falling on the moon, on that side of the moon, of course, because the moon is between us and the sun. But that light that's that's falling on the moon is coming from the Earth. So there's sunlight hitting the Earth and bouncing back to the sun. It's called Earth shine. And you can see that 
when the moon is a cres in crescent phase, you can see brightness on the dark part of the moon. And then this is what the composite looks like. And again, you can see that detail, um, which just blew me away when I first saw that. And you can still see the prominences and stuff on the edge of the sun and the and the corona. And the corona actually extends much farther out than this. Uh, there are very wide angle views that people get that show the corona just all. And of course, in, in essence, the corona goes all through the solar system, but the part that can be photographed is still goes pretty far out, several, several diameters of the sun away from the sun. So it's a neat thing. Um, and finally, here's just a few resources. Um, again, here's the links to the software. Um, check up on the status of that. I'm not especially optimistic about that. Um, there is a, an exposure calculator here. Again, the same fellow, Javier Hubier. Um, and there's a discussion of filters here. Mm. It's very, this is the American Astronomical Society. So it's a professional organization. They know what they're talking about. Um, and then a couple of really good resources are this first one, again, from the American Astronomical Society, um, photographing the eclipse. And another one, uh, Alan Dyer is a very, very experienced <clears throat> astrophotographer, night sky photographer. He's got a very good book of all, you know, covering all this stuff in much, much greater detail. And I highly recommend that. Um, so that's what I had. Um, I know it was a little long, but uh, there you go. Hmm. Zold, I had just one more quick little thing to, to add. The, the question about doing the uh, polar alignment uh, on, on a tracking map, and, and everybody you know knows that you, know, you can't do it during the daytime. And you know, Zolt had mentioned, well, if you go out the night before and set up your camera and system, but I'm I'm very reluctant to leave my camera and set up outside overnight if I don't have an eye on it all the time. So that you can do daytime polar alignment, and it's something that I've I've messed around with, and I don't know how well you can see this. Uh, it's called polar align, uh, I sorry, Polar Scope Align Pro. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's software. I use it all the time for when I'm doing polar alignment at night with my uh, Sky Guider Pro, but it has a function where you can press the, uh, the button and it will do something like this. And it, uh, you set it on top of your tracking mount will actually give you a reasonably decent daytime polar alignment. Mm. So just just something again. It um, it it was called um, Polar Scope Align Pro. Costs a little bit of money, but it's it's very very cheap. And uh, again, I I use it specifically for polar alignment uh, nighttime as well. So just just wanted to throw that in there real quick. Thanks. Uh Thank you, Zolf. Thank you, Rick. Questions for our uh, guests or our presenters tonight? Well, I, this isn't a, exactly a question about how to, but it was like the late 1980s or early 1990s. I was up in Kokomo for a totally different purpose. And there was maybe a partial solar eclipse what I noticed, especially with the leaf, shadows of leaves, I think this must have been in the late spring, shadows of leaves were duplicated. So there were two like very, very strong shadows, but there would be like two right next to each other or slightly overlapping. And I wondered if you remember what was going on at that time. In terms of yeah, I, I alluded to that, that the spaces in between the leaves of the trees act like little pinholes. Yeah. And each little space creates an image of the sun on the ground or on a surface. And so each of those will reflect whatever phase the sun's in. So that's a really neat way to experience the partial phases. It, it was very dramatic. Yep. I actually have an example of that um, on one of my slides that I didn't show. 
but I can show that real quick if people are interested. Um, okay, let's go back to this. So again, these are just some examples of stuff. Uh, here's again from where I was at the Tetons. That's the crowd that's getting ready to watch it. So here's that's that image. So huh. you can see that all those little spaces in between the trees are are pinholes creating these little. I didn't take this picture, but uh, uh, those, those are all little images of the sun. But that's, that's the safest way to view a partial eclipse of the sun. <laughs> you can also, I mean, you can make a little pinhole viewer too. Uh, there's lots of things online if you. You know, if if you uh, look up solar pinhole viewer, uh, mm -hmm. and again, you can do that with your hands. You can make little pinholes, or with a, or people use a, like a like a strainer, uh, like a colander or something it has lots of little holes in it, as uh, to to make pinholes. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, I'll show that. That's just stuff we've seen already. Mm -hmm. Ritz crackers work too. <laughs> <laughs> well, one other just real quick safety uh, comment because uh, I, I get this question a lot you know Zoltz presented some beautiful pictures showing these partial phases and as you get close to totality there'll be this diamond ring phase and then Bailey's beads phase and then total full totality and the question is when is it safe to take off my solar glasses and it's a little confusing because if you're photographing this, you're going to want to take your filters off your camera lenses a few seconds before totality, but not your eyeglasses. Yeah. It's only safe to take your eyeglasses, your solar glasses off at full totality, not diamond ring, not Bailey's beads. You've got to wait until full totality. And I've talked to a couple of optometrists and some other experts, and they said, absolutely. Full totality is the only time it's safe to take your solar glasses off your eyes. But for your camera and photographic equipment, you're going to want to do it like maybe 15 or 10 seconds before totality. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question, um, and maybe this was stated in the presentation. I apologize if I'm I'm repeating here. But does it make a difference if you set your camera for color or black and white? No, it's like any other photography. Uh, I again, I would just take everything in raw, <laughs> like usual. And if you want to make a black and white, you can make a black and white in post. Well, those it's problems no it makes no difference to your camera. Yeah. And why not record all the information? Sure. The the prominences can be a cool shade of pink or red or whatever they are. Right. I wouldn't do black and white. Yeah. As Zolt said, shoot it in raw. And, uh, you know, with the 11 year solar cycles, you know, everybody's got their fingers crossed that we'll see a lot more sun activity and, and sun spots and solar flares and who knows what's going to happen on April 8th. But, uh, and by the way, it's possible that there'll be a comet in the sky that's really bright. And during the eclipse, it might be possible to see a comet. And often stars and the planets, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of the planets will be up in the sky at, at eclipse time. And so <clears throat> that's obviously a rare thing to see planets in the sky in the daytime. Venus and Jupiter and Saturn are the brightest ones. And I can't remember now which ones are going to be in that part of the sky. Uh, I can look that up, but uh, it's another thing. And the brighter stars come out, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. But will they show up in your photographs? Because um, usually you expose for 25 seconds right. or 30 seconds. So you're right. not doing that. Well, the brighter objects will show up in the shorter exposures during totality. Mm -hmm. uh, the fainter stars obviously won't. But... Did, did somebody showed a picture of an eclipse sequence over a lake with mountains in the background? Yeah. Did I see another object, bright object in that picture? It seems like I did in the lower right hand. I don't. Okay. 
I, Zold, I think you're uh, the one where you show the big, large Corona, you know, the totality. Yes. Off to the left-hand side, there's a yes. little white dot. And, and I had a very similar picture, and I thought, what the heck is going on with my camera? <laughs> Come to find out, uh, it was Regulus. If you look over to the left, do do to the oh, left. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a star. That's Regulus showing up during the middle of the totality. It's the brightest star in the constellation Leo. Uh, and actually, there's another one yeah. right over here. There, there are some things. It's either specks of dust on my screen or something. There are some <laughs> little faint white dots in that. Yeah. That's so, pretty yeah, that was, that was another fun surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Catching the Earth shine on the moon, that was that's pretty amazing. That, that just that just blew me away. And the yeah. prominences. That I mean, I've seen prominences in eclipse pictures before, but I had never seen uh, the Earth shine before. I'm sure people have gotten it before, but I'd never seen it. Did Did you use that exposure calculator software to do your exposures during totality result? Yeah, probably. I, I use that as a guideline, and then uh, I don't. I dialed in just a huge range of exposures into the software. Okay. So you were just blasting away to yeah. catch as much as you could. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the, the really big advantages of using some of the software control uh, to, to drive your camera it's because it's going to be consistently bracketing everything, mm -hmm. but it's also keeping very, very, very close track of what the phases are and the yeah. timing of those phases. And, and for those of you that have never seen a total eclipse before, <laughs> when you get close to totality, it is so amazing, so overwhelming, so exciting, so incredible that to try to sit there and think about pressing buttons on your camera, it's just, <laughs> you're gonna struggle. So, and I actually had two cameras running, but the software was driving both of them. So I got to sit back and really watch the spectacle. Mm. It was mm. truly amazing. So uh, before you, you can use the intervalometer in your camera or an external intervalometer uh, with bracketing if your camera allows you to bracket uh, some of them go up to like nine nine frames i think bracketed mm -hmm. with one or two or even three stops between them mm -hmm. so that that's an option if you don't uh, have you know if that software is not available yeah so uh it, it it sounds like we are going to be very close to the solar max. Uh, so ch chances are, uh, if we get shots of the uh, eclipse, uh, we will we will get some very interesting things going on. The 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 probabilities on the weather that I've seen say there's about a sixty to sixty five percent chance that we will not get to see the eclipse because it'll be behind a cloud. So is there anything else to photograph? Uh, will there be <laughs> anything? I mean, will there be anything interesting going on in the clouds or can you try to capture something, you know, g given given that uh, we may not get to see the eclipse itself, what else do you do while, while you're waiting? Well, that's, a, that's the uh, $64,000 question. Um, it will get dark. It will still get dark, but it'll kind of be gray and dark. <laughs> so I, I don't really know. It depends entirely on the precise conditions. You know, if there's holes in the clouds, uh, it may be kind of like sunset. Um, but but I really I really don't know. When I did it in 2017, there were broken clouds with enough breaks in the clouds to still get lots of good pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or Zolt, do you come up with several places to go, and then when the weather changes, you've got a couple plan B and plan C's to to plan where you take your photos? I have not made those arrangements. Um, I, I'm kind of reluctant to, <laughs> I mean, my, my thinking is that how many times in anyone's lifetime does the, does the total solar eclipse path go right over your house? I mean, I'm nearly in the center of the eclipse path in my backyard. I assume you bought your house for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That was the number one priority. Yeah. So I think Jack's house is even closer. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I'm sort of emotionally, I, I feel like just staying put. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people do that. They'll, they'll kind of scope out different locations 
Um, now, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that there's going to be a lot of people around mm. in the path of totality. And uh, the traffic is going to be interesting. Yeah. Obviously, it's going to be most interesting before and after the eclipse. Mm -hmm. Even during the eclipse, if people are trying to find holes in the clouds, you know, I don't really want to be on the road fighting all this traffic. <laughs> Yeah, when they're all staring up in the sky while they're driving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I went to Kentucky Lake for the last one down at Land Between the Lakes and went down a day early, got fortunate. So anyway, the drive home was horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found was, I believe everybody from the state of Illinois westward decided to go to Kentucky Lake. Uh, I, had, I, I mean, literally, the interstates were solid stop and go traffic for mile upon mile because mm -hmm. people from Louisville came down to Kentucky Lake. It was just, yeah, mm -hmm. it was, it, it was, it was crazy, is what it was. They've been doing the Department of Homeland Security has been doing a lot of uh, studies and and planning on this, and if you look at that path of totality you know from from southwest to northeast and you look just on the outside of that they they're calculating how many millions and millions and millions of people live just outside that are all going to drive to mm -hmm. that path. so you got st louis is going to drive down chicago's going to drive down cincinnati's going to drive up louisville's going to drive and they're just all going to converge and that's just here in indiana yeah and you go along that whole pathway so the day of the eclipse, if you're not in place, probably by eight or nine in the morning, forget it. You're trying to drive somewhere, you're probably not going to make it. But the worst of the worst, as you just described, is when the eclipse is over. Mm -hmm. It's gridlock, and it's not just two or three hours. Mm -hmm. And and the the Homeland Security guys have been saying, you know, to the city planners, they've mm -hmm. said, think of it as 70 Super Bowls all letting out all at once. <laughs> that, is, what, that is so scary <laughs> or the indianapolis 500 yeah you know 20 of those letting out all at once so it's not just two and three and four hours they're talking about 12 hours of gridlock mm. so, so camp somewhere or find a hotel go to a bar <laughs> do something yeah. and then drive home the next day well just break out the laptop and start processing your pictures yeah. for a couple hours no I tried to do that in 2017, but the, the internet crashed terrible hours <laughs> afterwards also. So, yeah, I, um, but, you know, kind of going back to the question, I've been looking at that path of totality and then trying to plot out, okay, if the weather's bad here, what, where do I get in two hours? How far can I go in four hours? Where about six hours? What about eight hours? And, and I don't want to drive any more than eight hours. So that'll get me down to Arkansas, almost to Texas somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, the other direction up, you know, Northeast. But that's kind of my general plan right now. But I'm I'm with Zolt. I, I want to sit on my back porch, aim my camera up and just click away. Hmm. I was wondering, I have a lot of friends in Brown County. Are they going to get the same effect that we will here in Bloomington? Oh yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. pretty close because uh, that's you know that's not far off the center. Yeah. And and It'll when be you a little shorter, but not much. Yeah. When, so when you talk about same effect, or it's still going to get very dark, and Brown County is going to miss out by three or four seconds of total. No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. It's still mm -hmm. in the path. Oh yeah, no, no I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I misspoke. I think they're going to miss out. The amount of totality, the oh, length yeah. of totality, is three four shorter. seconds shorter yeah. than what Bloomington. There, there are there are tools online that you can go to any place and see mm. all the details, how long it's going to last, when it's going to start, when it's going to end. Okay, great. I was just going to add. Don and I had the privilege of seeing uh, an eclipse in India. And for that, they took us to a wildlife preserve. So all the birds went to sleep in the middle of the totality. So, so there could be some interesting ways to see something with nature uh, as well as. 
Yeah, the, the birds were acting as if it was, it was it dusk was, and uh, the, the sun was going down. Yeah, there was a, a, a very large tree that had, you know, maybe 50 birds nesting in it. They all went to sleep. At, it, I think this was almost at noon. And then they all woke back up after totality. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, the, the other weird thing uh, in India is uh, a total eclipse is a very bad omen. So traffic in the capital was 1% of normal that day. Because you were supposed to stay yeah, home you, with all yeah, your doors stayed in. and windows <laughs> shut. So so it was very yeah. difficult to find housing because no one wanted to leave their home. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I'm going to terminate the or stop the recording if I can figure this out.